us. Uh, my name is Adam Elster. I'm the president of CA Technology. I run all of our global field operations. So my responsibilities include <coughs> all of our customer-facing organization, our sales, our professional services organization, our partner organization, and pre-sales. That includes all geographies around the world, our vertical areas as well. So, I, uh, you know, last year when we talked about CA, our transformation and our strategy, you know, a lot of the questions that we got from journalists and not just from customers were, you wanted to hear some more stories. You wanted to understand what were some of the business challenges that customers were facing and how we were able to help them. So it's, what's interesting, and I want to give a little context, and we're calling this Masters of the Modern Software Factory, is Modern Software Factory wasn't something uh, we bought from a marketing organization. So we didn't go to a marketing group and say, okay, what do you have that tells this big story? It wasn't that. What it was, we started talking about customers and what their business challenges were. They were talking about the business value that they needed to achieve and how we could partner with them. And then when they looked at the portfolio of technology that we've been investing in and building over the last several years, that we had a key role to be partners with them to drive that business value. And we were listening, and I would tell you, Modern Software Factory came out of us listening and saying, what's the business value you're trying to achieve, and how can we take our expertise, either with technology, or consulting, or strategy, to help you achieve that end result? So what we wanted to do today is we're gonna have a panel here, and what we wanted to do is share, have a, a number of our key customers and partners tell stories about what they're seeing in the marketplace. When all of you hear the words business transformation, app economy, agility, and you hear every buzzword that you hear out there, what does it really mean around business value? What was the challenge an organization was trying to go through to transform either culturally, technology, and what were the ways that they were able to achieve them, and how we've partnered with them to achieve the result. So we brought together some of the, the partners and customers that we've been working for, with. And the idea around this session is I'm going to introduce each one of the panelists. They'll be able to tell you, you know, they'll spend a few minutes telling the story of their organization, what the business challenge was, what the value that they were trying to achieve, and how we helped them do that. So we're going to spend about half the time letting each one of the panelists tell you their story. And then from there, we're going to open up for questions. And hopefully, we can make it pretty interactive in, the, in the, the second part of the session where you should feel free to ask some of the questions and why this isn't just a PowerPoint or a demonstration of technology, but what's the real business outcome, which is ultimately what we're trying to achieve as an organization. So I'm going to start off, uh, I think I'm going to start off with you, Daniel. So Daniel's with uh, ProDam. And uh, he has a really amazing story about the transformation with his organization and what they were trying to achieve. So Daniel, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves and uh, give everyone a little bit of the background of your project. All right. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's an honor to be here sharing with you uh, a little bit of, the, of our history in Amazonas. And uh, at first, I would like to, uh, to explain a little bit what's the reality that we have in Amazons and, and uh, how uh, was born this project. Uh, Amazonas is, uh, is the biggest state in Brazil. Uh, making an uh, American comparison, we are three times bigger than Texas. And we have a four million people uh, uh, living in Amazonas. This four million people lives two million in the capital, and two million lives uh, in another city, in another cities, or even uh, in the middle of the rainforest. Uh, and the government needs to, to deliver service for the citizen uh, if the citizen lives in the capital or even if he lives in the, the middle of the reforms. Uh, our economy, uh, our GDP is about $28 billion and our GDP is 70% is based on industry. And our industry is focused uh, mainly in technology. 50% of the production of the, our industry is from mobile phones and 20% for another uh, uh, technology assets. So our people is very close to technology. And it's important to say because when you talk about citizens, when you talk about Amazons, when you talk about Brazil, and uh, some people uh, may think that we have only three animals, that the people doesn't have access to, to smartphone, to internet. 
but we have the opposite. We have a people that is close to technology and that really expect that the movement well, provides us another and, uh, with uh, using mobile, mobile technology, for example. And another challenge that we have uh, is that Prodan is an agency, an IT agency that is uh, four or seven years old. And we have too many legacy systems. And what problem we have? And uh, each legacy system we have, uh, we consider the citizen as his role. Uh, sometimes I'm a father, sometimes I'm a driver, sometimes I'm taking some health service. And our, our challenge is how to integrate many databases and, and consider, consider only one citizen. Uh, I'm Daniel and sometimes I'm a father, sometimes I'm a driver, but always I'm Daniel. And, and this is the main challenge, how to provide this service, how to consider that Daniel is only one citizen, and uh, ensuring security, for, for example. And, and all these uh, this contents, these contents uh, uh, provided uh, uh, the application of the Amazon is the palm of your hands. Uh, it's not only an application, uh, but we consider that's the main way that we have uh, now to provide a cultural transformation in our society. Uh, it's important to say because we're talking about changing behaviors, we not uh, not only for the citizen but uh, for the public manager too. We're changing a culture that uh, until now uh, need paper to do something, and now we're talking about people that needs technology. And uh, when we wake up, for example, I get my cell phone to see my mail, my news, and as a citizen, I always I, I need to to get the service of the government in, in the palm of my hands, and this is the, the heart of our solution. How to become the government uh, in a platform? How to to become the government as a service? And uh, consider an important uh, variable that is the, the user experience. Uh, we say in, in Prodan that we translated a problem, not, in, well, not only in an IT solution, but a citizen experience. Uh, and it's our, our goal, how to provide a good experience even to a citizen that lives in the middle of the rainforest or even to a PhD that lives and works in Amazonas. And we need to be uh, uh, focused uh, on user experience and provide an easy solution to everybody. And uh, our solution is already run, uh, and we have some interesting uh, numbers, for example, uh, we had one service that was the school registration that we got something like about five, six uh, thousand uh, requisitions per second uh, in our solution. Uh, so I'm talking about a system that uh, didn't uh, need to go to a, a line and he made this, uh, he got the service uh, in, in his house uh, watching TV. Uh, and it's important to say it, this because when we, when we do this, we, we are reducing costs for the government and this, this money that we save can be used to our economic and social uh, development or even to preserve our rainforest. Uh, and so uh, everything that I say uh, uh, together, combined, it, uh, allow, allow us to uh, <coughs> provide this transformation in our society. Uh, and our, our citizens is our already satisfied, is already uh, got uh, the, the benefits with the, the application. Uh, and not only with the application, but with the transformation that we have done. Uh, we participated of a study in Brazil that showed us that uh, for each dollar that we invest on IT, uh, we can uh, reduce about three dollars on operational cost of government. And how we do this? Uh, reducing the human context, uh, we don't need any more uh, physical offices to, to support the citizen uh, for everything. Uh, we can reduce the operational loss uh, because you can process payments and fines without viewers and uh, we can to, uh, to provide better service to, to, the, to the government and for the citizen. Uh, so this is the Amazon is in the power of a hand. That's not only an application, but a solution that can 
can be, it's being used to, to provide better service uh, to our citizens and to promote uh, uh, this transformation that we want, not only to preserve the, the rainforest, but to promote the economic and social development of our region. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. I mean, it's a really great story when you talk about digital transformation and you hear Daniel's story and people who think about transformation and, and what that means. And you talk about, you know, their, their real goal is to preserve the Amazon. And if you think about if you had to lay infrastructure and put in these services, what the impact would it have? And it's really interesting to hear Daniel's service story and hear about their transformation and what's that done to change the experience that the citizens are having how it improves their lives, does it affect, improves cost. It's really a great story. So I think it's a great example of digital transformation. And I encourage you afterwards also, he's got it you know, in the palm of his hand. So if you actually want to see it, it's an amazing demo. He has it in, in his suit jacket. That's where that application lives. Um, but it's a great story. And as much as images of digital transformation tend to, a lot of us think about big cities and financial services and things like that. Digital transformation is happening absolutely everywhere, and it really can eliminate barriers and boundaries all over the world. So I think it's a really incredible story. So Mo, we were talking yesterday about the transformation and your story at SGM. We were talking about how much of some of this change is both cultural as well as technology enabled. So I thought maybe, appreciate if you could tell everyone the story about SGM, your transformation, and what you're working on. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, we're not saving the rainforest, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so SGN are the largest gas distribution uh, company in the UK. We are part of critical national infrastructure. And essentially our business model is broken down into two parts. The first part is regulated business, where essentially we're paid by government to distribute gas to around five and a half million homes up and down the, the, the UK, including the whole of Scotland. And we're also paid to manage and service those pipes, as well as a pseudo blue light service for gas escapes. Um, so that part of the industry, uh, not just for us, for, for uh, the whole of the utilities sector, is increasingly coming under um, cost challenges. Uh, and in fact, Theresa May, the Prime Minister, was on the news a few weeks ago. Um, was again highlighting the fact that there was going to be probably new legislation around tightening the costs that, that the utility sector were charging out to the customers. So, so we know that we have a constraint in that area. The, the other part of our business is unregulated and it really touches on a couple of things and it's really about how we've been touched by parts of IoT, um, sorry, um, the internet of things, sorry about IoT. So we are looking now at smart metering as a new business unit, so we'll be pushing out and supporting the UK strategy for deploying smart meters up and down the UK by 2020. Um, we're also increasingly looking at using drones to go through, um, um, the right word is, um, sorry, so it's through to pass certain areas that we can't get to easily in Scotland after there's been a storm, for example, to inspect pipes. And also new innovations that we look at for new business opportunities is around using robots to go and inspect the pipes. So we've just completed nationally a program of replacing all of our copper pipes with plastic pipes. What this has meant is there's the opportunity now to use robots to go and inspect the pipes, not only to do predictive analytics around there are certain times during the year, depending on weather or when you're likely to see cracks and breaks, but also for the robots to have the ability to repair them. So that for us is, is quite significant. And I think overall what it's done is put a pressure under the organization to really um, change its operating model in order to be able to support these new innovation opportunities or these new business streams. So around 18 months ago, there was a strategic position um, put to the board that in order for us to meet this business, uh, this new business model, we were gonna need to move to cloud first in order to provide us with some of the agility, speed, redundancy, cost reductions. And more importantly, it was around making sure that we could improve, we could provide a security wrap around all of that. So as we took this journey into the cloud, one of the opportunities that we had was also to review and rethink what security meant. So working with the National Cyber Security Center and with our security partners, we put together a, a strategic security plan 
and, and what we wanted to do was really make sure we prioritised on what were the fundamental risks that we were looking to protect across our environment. We used a process called attack path mapping, which is a process of looking at what the most likely attack routes a attacker would take, and then making sure that you have the right tools to be able to identify and respond to that. Um, and what really came out of the work that we did was privileged access management, continued to put privilege, sorry, I would take that back, what really came out of that is that every attack that we've seen, and there's been lots of press recently, and there's been some articles today from the NCSC about attacks towards the UK utility sector, have always looked at compromising and escalating the main privileges, and that's the main goal. So for us, privileged access management was really at the very heart of the layered security model that we wanted to take on. So, um, so, so that's essentially the, the journey that we've gone on, and we wanted to make sure when we're looking at, at uh, the right partner uh, and making the selection criteria for our privileged access management was someone who was not only strategic and had a, a, a platform that we could utilize, but also someone that was strategic enough to understand the journey that we were going on and partner with us across this journey. Um, and that's subsequently what we've done with CA with their privileged access management tool, and that's currently what we're continuing to deploy. It's great. So I think it's a again an another great story where you're talking about a traditional business that has to go through a transformation to cloud, but it's still public utility, highly regulated area. All times when you think of new cutting edge technology, and you know, and you talk about robotics and IoT and all of these things puts all kinds of new demands and expectations in the business. And I think it's a great story about transformation, maybe not in some of the traditional areas you might think of when you think about transformation, but great story about it. So Matt, one of the things we've been talking about a lot is agility. So one of the things that I think no one in this room is uh, surprised to hear is, you know, waterfall methodology, multi-year projects are becoming fewer and fewer. And it's more and more important for organizations to be agile, to meet demands, to handle that. And now you have a great story to talk about Telstra and how uh, you've been able to uh, simplify the way you've been able to run the business to really create that agility. Because what business users are, users are really asking for, how can you shorten the time between, between their idea and a new project? And a lot goes into becoming that agile. So maybe you can share your story. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, so Telstra is the largest telecommunications company in Australia. So we spend about four and a half billion dollars a year on projects, and that makes up about three and a half thousand projects. So as Adam mentioned, so that idea pipeline and getting it into annual planning cycle is obviously very, very important and a very onerous uh, process across the whole organisation to make sure we spend that wisely. Uh, we've been with CAPPM and, and previously Clarity since 2008, and as an ex-government department, uh, we've been very good at obviously customising that and turning it into our own version of software. But when we stood back from that, we then had minimal use at, at, from our project manager and our project manager community. So we have about 1,500 project managers and our project uh, team members are around 10,000. So what we had is a bare minimum amount of data going through our PPM system. So as much as we control the money there, they would put the bare minimum in, we would give them the money. So. Standing back from that, we've got a system that we can get no insights out, it's got bare minimum data, it's really not doing what it needs to do as a, a portfolio project management system, especially in today's age with, with agile management and everything else. So when we stood back from that and said, to upgrade this is gonna cost us $3 million and we're really just gonna pick up and move forward onto the latest version because we fell off the upgrade path three years after installing it. So back in 2011, we were off the upgrade path um, Getting, getting, becoming unsupported as well. So to drive the behavioural change, what we thought is we'll just leave that current system behind. We'll actually just burn that bridge and leave it there and let's focus on the behaviours and the change that we need to put in the business going forward to become you know, best practice in relation to portfolio project management across the organisation. I think the biggest challenge in relation to you know, the modern software factory is it's not about changing the IT and handing over requirements now. It's about looking at the business and how you change your business to operate within what the best practice PPM system is across the organisation. Obviously, huge clients such as JB Morgan and Standard Charter and a number of other organisations across the world, you know, there's a reason why CA have designed the product in that certain way. So 
the journey we want to always tell story is really to educate the, the stakeholders about, hey, maybe we're not the best, maybe we need to align what global best practice looks like. So considering all of that, we decided to go to see a PPM uh, on cloud. Um, and one of the good things about going on cloud and taking that product as it is, it does force the rails. So there are certain things you can't do when you're on the cloud, which is a good thing to help control the, uh, the stakeholders when they put their wish list forward in, in relation to that. So, so our journey was really around then changing the business and the changing the way we looked at it. And one of the main objectives and what you want out of a good project portfolio management system is obviously the data to again then get the insight to then help with the reporting and educating our executives and being able to enable our executives to make the right decisions, both on the right product allocations around those as far as where we're investing and making sure we're doing the right projects at the right time. So to do that, we need that increase in data. And really to lift that increase in data, we stood back from that and said, well, what's the best driver that's going to give us this uplift? If we just give them a new software tool, they're still just going to do the bare minimum to get the money out. So what we actually looked at is said, well, I think the key thing here is really around reporting. So the report, the executives want to see the reporting, they want to see what's coming out, which is historically all offline. So if we can mandate from an executive top-down position that the only report that exists for a project across Telstra is something that comes out of PPM, then the project managers are gonna to have to put in their issues and risks, schedules of being up to date and all the rest of it. So that was a key driver for us to change the behavior as far as what goes in there. So currently we have 95% of our projects doing reporting on a minimum monthly basis, and our large strategic programs actually have to report <coughs> to the COLT actually on a weekly basis, so all coming out of PPM. And we've managed to achieve that within six months. So a huge uplift now with data and insights that we've got in there. The next part of our journey, what we really want to start looking at is then looking at predictive analytics. So looking at what the project managers are saying in relation to their status report, and starting to get intel so that we can predict when a project's going bad before a project manager wants to even tell us that it's going bad. So that, that's been a huge success story for us. And part of the carrot also to the project managers are changing it. Historically, we had what we call the system controlled traffic lights. So the traffic lights were driven from the data that was contained uh, in our PPM system. So what we did is we took all that away. So we've said to the project manager, you choose what traffic lights that you want to report, you write your commentary, the financials are the financials, your risks are in there, your risks are in there. So we really empowered the project manager to tell their story and enable the tool to be used, how the tool could be used. So as an example around that, we've, we've greatly changed how we uh, manage financials in the system, so very much simplified that. Um, we had a separate control of what we call a funds release. We have a stage-gated model. So that was disconnected from the core financials, such as a budget, a forecast, etc. So by tying those two together, if you need your money, then you have to forecast accurately, otherwise we can't give you that money. Again, that's greatly changed the behaviour that our project managers need to go, to, go through uh, as far as improving that. And also on managing those financials as far as when we're loading their actuals back. Uh, we've managed to reduce the pro end of month processing time for a project manager from on average 30 minutes down to six minutes. So you times that by 1,500 project managers, we're saving 1,200 hours a month just on updating actuals um, in relation to the, to the system and adjusting their forecasts accordingly. So uh, overall, the, um, it, it's been a lot of business change. So change management has been very happy and, and a lot of behavioral change in relation to that. But the success story out of, out of it is really that we've got 95% of status report, we have more data than we know what to do with yet, so we're catching up in relation to that, how we can use that data now and, and gain further insights out of it. But the best bit of all as far as CABPM and being on SAS is at the end of this month we'll be upgrading to a major release across 1,500 users and 4.5 billion. For less than $20,000 we're going to the next version. So we'll be able to continue to do that every time CA brings a release out, we'll be able to be at the latest edge of the uh, modern software factory and always be using the latest tool, which is just a huge success for an organization of our size. Great, thanks, I mean, it's a great story when you hear some of the challenges that companies are facing, how do they become agile, how do they make better decisions. When you run an organization at scale with 10,000 people working on a project, you have to, how do you, how do you become agile at scale? How do you make decisions faster? How can you enable, I think the statistic you were telling me yesterday is you used to have, what, 2,500 reports? 250 reports. And what are you down to? We're down to 12. 12. So I think my statistic was if you could get 10,000 people actually writing code to help your business, as opposed to writing reports in one of our tools, 
that would really change the productivity of your business. So I think it's a great story. So Phil, one of the things uh, you and I talk about quite often is you hear everyone talk about the cloud. And everything's moving to the cloud. And uh, when you hear the complexity and the scale of business and transformation, I thought maybe you could give us a little bit of your perspective on everything moving to the cloud or, and what you're seeing around the globe with your business. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Adam. First, uh, thank you, appreciate the invitation. Um, you know, if I think about 10 years ago or five years ago, you probably wouldn't see someone from IBM sitting here. <laughs> and when you think about you know, how the market's uh, evolved and both <coughs> firms being client-centric, trying to do what's right for our mutual clients, uh, we've developed, developed what I would say a very strong work relationship. Um, we're actually honored that uh, you and your team honored us with the uh, partner of the year. So we, we appreciate that, the recognition that our teams are doing together. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, when I look at what's going on in the marketplace, uh, kind of put it in like three, three dimensions. You know, one, you know, all our clients are trying to transform, they're trying to transform digitally. And uh, the first thing is that, you know, cost, while it's important uh, for their business, it's about speed. How do they move faster? How do they move uh, their applications faster? How do they create business value faster? And so while they want to save money and efficiency, you know, for them to be successful, it's around speed. Uh, the second piece is around the transformation. And now it's all about digital transformation, how to move to the cloud, multiple clouds, hybrid cloud, on-prem, off-prem, public, private. How do you manage that transformation, that digital transformation in a secure way? And then the third element is they want to see real tangible business outcomes. So everybody's talking about moving everything to the cloud. And to me, it's going to be a combination of things. As I just said, it's going to be hybrid cloud. You can have some clients that will keep things on-prem for potential regulatory reasons around the world. You can have folks that have multiple public clouds, multiple private clouds, and that whole ecosystem working together. And to me, you know, how do you operate in those different domains? And one of the things just kind of as a proof point that we work together on, which kind of picks off the theme with, with Daniel, we work with the uh, Commonwealth of Kentucky, where what they were trying to do is bring to market some human services fast. They wanted to do it in an efficient manner. They wanted to digitally transform how they provide services to their constituents, the citizens, and they needed to have material business outcomes with that. And so we worked together and built a solution together where we helped migrate them to a, a Z cloud uh, together where it had a tremendous economic value but also what it was doing, it was providing their citizens, whether it was self-service, uh, health and human services, how to enable consumable services for elderly, uh, nutritional value for some of the senior citizens. And so you think about you know, the partnership and the outcomes. Uh, what we were able to do together, we wouldn't be able to do individually. And again, around that speed, around that efficiency, the digital transformation, and real tangible outcomes, you know, uh, I think that's a good example of how we've partnered together in the industry and in the marketplace to, to help our mutual clients. It's kind of along the lines of what you were doing in the Amazon. Great. Thanks, Phil. I yeah, I guess what you're getting with the theme, what we're talking about in our partnership with IBM is, you know, CA as an organization, what we're finding in the marketplace is our customers are asking to work better with our partners and their partners because what they're asking for is business value. So what they're realizing is, you know, they can't do it all by themselves. They need to have better partnership with some of the technology vendors like us. But that frankly, for this to work at the scale and the complexity, we actually have to work better with our partners as well. And in this world, not everything's gonna be cloud, not everything's gonna be CA, it's not gonna be IBM, it's gonna be a mixture. But to get that kind of business value, we have to work better together. And I will tell you, that is what our customers are asking of us. So I'm hoping as you, want, as you listen to some of these stories and you hear us talking about modern software factory, it's really a framework for us to talk to customers about the business challenges they're facing and how they believe that they can uh, partner with us and others to retrieve some result. So it might be some businesses that you would typically think are in older industries 
and how they want to move to the cloud or how they need to be more agile or, or how they can deliver better services. And for us, when you look at the portfolio that we've been involved in recently, we no longer look at it as one product solution. It's a series of products, it's a series of partnership, but it's all about business value and it's about those outcomes. And I think what you're hearing is some very tangible business problems for consumers, for the B2B world, where they're utilizing technology for the transformation. And it's not just the PowerPoint and the demo of product. These are real companies that need to transform themselves. And some of it is culture, some of technology, but as all of us are seeing in the economy, we need to transform digitally in order to have a different experience. We all face that in our daily lives. And some of the things you might not be thinking about it, whether it's your cell service or government services or the utility that you're working with, some of the things you're not like thinking front of mind let me tell you, that same digital transformation is, ha is happening across all of these industries across the globe. So hopefully this gave you some insight into some very real tangible stories of what's happening in the marketplace. And as you think about software factory and the technology and digital transformation, hopefully this gives you some tangible results that for many of you, this probably affects your daily life more than you actually know. And whether it's you paying a bill online or things you're doing, you probably didn't realize that, okay, you like that it's easier to do this thing or you like that it's easier to pay the bill, but behind all of those things is all of these organizations and their transformation that enables that. And that's really for us what the modern software factory is. So hopefully these are some great examples for you. So we have about 15 minutes left in the session. So what we thought we'd do is just open it up to see if we have some uh, questions in the room. There's a microphone. So uh, we have someone right here. Right here. Okay. Sorry. <coughs> I can't get there from here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Steve Watson, RIT Trends and Analysis. Looking at the, the journeys that you've been on, how would you compare or which would you rate as most significant technology issues, the uh, security wrapped around that technology, yep. or the culture as being um, the most difficult or, or the most important to deal with? And any comments you have on that, I appreciate it. So, Mo, do you mind? We talked about them. Yeah, same, we, same. I asked Mo that same question yesterday, so I'm going to re answer it today. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great lineup. Uh, <laughs> so, like set up. Yeah, so, so we have a term that we regularly use, which is that um, culture means technology. And that's what we've seen regularly. You know? And I think that the culture bit is, is still fundamentally the hardest thing. Um, that, that's my experience. Yeah. And again, it's interesting when even when we talk about very successful organizations who have gone through a transformation, what's interesting is that in, in many cases, they will tell me they do really well at the first phase and they've set up a clean room or a new project or they remodeled one area of a floor to do this transformation and then sometimes they can stall. And when we talk about why does it stall, it tends to be around the word adoption, culturally. And I even had some organizations who came to see World last year who were rolling out DevOps. And they didn't want a product demo. They didn't want consulting help. They wanted internal marketing support. And I literally was having one of those meetings where, not the typical meeting when a customer comes up to me and they wanted to know if they could use some of my material that I use to train our internal staff around DevOps and what it means because they wanted to run a training program to drive that cultural change and adoption to what agility meant, what DevOps meant. So I would agree with Mo. I think if you don't get the culture right, the technology, well, it's important. If you don't get the culture right, you're gonna have a hard time. I think, Matt, that's a lot of what you talked about in getting people to adopt a new way of thinking, right? Yeah, exactly right. I think the, um, the big change for us, so we, we managed to do this in 12 months and that's really because we didn't change the software. So most of us were sort of integration and security as far as moving to CAPVM and a little bit of configuration. Um, but what's different today of what we did is we spent 12 months doing the IT piece and we spent 12 months doing change management in parallel. So for 12 months we were having discussions with our stakeholders as far as what's going to be different, what we expect and here's what the system will be. So. 
And then what we did is really put in a hard stop to create that cultural change by basically saying, you need to do our online module that we've developed before we're going to give you the keys to get your system and get your money. So here's our expectation. Here's not just how you system, but here's how you're going to behave now on that new system. So um, but very different to traditionally how you would have done, well, you probably would have done 12 months worth of IT development and maybe three months worth of change. It's now you know, the same period of time really to get that cultural behavioral change to adopt. Great, thank you. Other questions? Thank you for sharing. Um, this is Tom Smith with DZone. Can you talk a little bit about how you got started? I frequently hear about the need to start small and then scale up. Daniel, maybe you want to take that on? I mean, you want to talk about how you started with the project and how you guys decided to approach it? All right. Uh, we decided to start the project about 12 months ago. And we started uh, with a, a, a a small, uh, a small amount of service. So we decided to, to focus on some uh, relevant service for society, and we decided to focus on education, traffic, and news. And uh, why this uh, this set of service? Because this set of service was the majority of the of the demand that we had. And so uh, when you when you deliver the, the educational service, for example, uh, we got uh, amazing results that uh, and not only in the infrastructure and the benefits, but the user experience. And these results that we got uh, allow us to, to increase the, the, the wide of service that we provide and to deliver better service. So uh, it was important to start uh, with a, a small amount of service, so going to scale uh, the, the, the amount. So uh, it, it was important, it's important to say too, that we learn uh, very, uh, very much to, uh, along the, the journey. Uh, in, in the partnership of CA was uh, important because uh, together we can build the infrastructure necessary to, to provide the service with API Gateway, with the Identity Manager, with the SSO. SSO. So this set of service we start to small to scale. What do you see in the film market? Yeah, yeah. um, along the theme, you know, you think about uh, the old-fashioned big bang, you know, big projects that kind of has gone away when you think about agility now. You know, speed, learn, fail fast. And so what you find now, the uh, many clients, they have their digital transformation, and what they're looking at is how do you get it more consumable, right? How do you get things more tangible, how do you learn, how do you iterate through things. But the other part that we talked about before is the cultural transformation. That helps the cultural transformation. Because as you get confident with the technology, you start to see the embrace these new methodologies, these new techniques, these new applications, and that helps your cultural transformation versus you run a long like seven year journey, it's gonna take two years to see any outcome. That doesn't work today. I mean today you know, everyone wants instantaneous feedback. They want to see tangible results. So the whole notion of agility, learning, iterating, helps that transformation, helps the cultural transformation, and you find the teams as they learn, they accelerate much faster, and you see the productivity happen. And so that's where you're really gonna start to see the benefits for companies. And then the other part too, is you start to get some quick hits, some wins, People start to get energy, and then, as we all know, momentum is very contagious. And so the whole organization then embraces these changes, and again, it brings it along. You see the business benefits, you see the learning, and then it brings along the culture much at a much faster rate. Yeah, I agree. I would tell you, and I couldn't agree with Phil more, one of the things that's interesting in this day and age is how quickly things go viral. So whether it's a tweet now, a YouTube, a joke, whatever it is, things <coughs> in society go pretty viral. The same kind of behavior is happening within organizations. So when a department sees that Daniel and his team has added a service and they've used an API to connect to a legacy system, I gotta tell you, as opposed to Daniel having to run around and say, hey, would you like to work with us? Can I convince you? It actually works the other way. They start seeing these things, it's like, hey, I wanna do this also. 
I want to do this. Even at CA, when we started rolling out Agile probably five, six years ago, it had a slow start. Then it went a real viral of, hey, I heard there's this Agile training. I want to go to that training. That sounds really cool. And there's a, the whole viral nature to how people discover things now and adopt. I would tell you, I couldn't agree with Phil more. It, it's not just having a small project and showing success. When people start hearing about it, it drives some of that cultural change as well. And I think that's a really important part of the journey. Just to add further on to what yeah. you both say, which is totally agree. So we did four releases, so minor releases and then the major release before we go live. And then further to that, what helps with greatly the adoption and the change management strategy is what we can see. We were releasing features that they didn't have in other systems and then paralleling data to do that. But what they gave us is we could more like a direct marketing operation. So I can see who's using it. When we put out our comm strategy, we can say, okay, that drove an increase in adoption on the new system. So we can constantly iterate to bring it scale up. Before the time we went live, we had sort of 85% people that had already experienced the new system. Where previously it was big back, you know, you're on off, you have a bit of time to use it. So the fact you can iterate, communicate, change management strategy, add more training, and change those approaches, just seamlessly you can transition from one system into the new one. Yeah, for a vendor, look, feedback is a gift, right? The number one, you know, as much as people come to CA World and we think they're going to learn something, I can tell you, I generally leave CA World, world learning more about our customers and the business. And I think we become better listeners. One of the value of SaaS solutions is you get to listen. How do I listen? I can look at a SaaS solution and see who's using it. How many are they really adopting it? Are they using the technology? What features are they using? What are they ignoring? That's instant feedback of what's working and not working. And I think that's one thing all organizations are learning better about. If you're gonna be agile, you gotta become a better listener because then you can respond better to what other people are. Other questions? All right, well I appreciate, do you have a question about that? You know, Hi, right, thanks for squeezing me in. One, one question I have is for, uh, as large organizations go through this change, uh, what does that do on the workforce side in terms of your talent? You're seeing retention and engagement change, or is recruiting better? As, as you're using more modern technologies, how's that impacting you, uh, your efforts on the workforce side? Good, Mo, well, what's your view of this? How's this affecting your workforce? So, so I think it does change the workforce. Um, and I think what it does is, because essentially, uh, and it touches on the, the question that we had previously, or a few questions a bit back around the culture. Essentially, the challenge that you have is that if you've got the people doing the same business operations as they do today, and you take them to a more agile platform, and they do the same thing as they did before, they're just doing the same process on a SaaS platform. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't change anything. When you, when you look at the opportunities that you have for the new platforms, it means you have to review what your department's teams, roles look like because some of them will possibly not be valid. Um, others may morph into, into another type of role uh, and others may mean that there's an opportunity for them to retrain completely and move into another part of the department. So I think it's dependent on what that change is. But, but certainly, yes, there, there has to be that change because it fits in with the, that transformation. What are you saying, Phil, as far as the workforce? It's an interesting uh, point. And so when you bring these agile methodologies, and say you had you know, someone that's working on you know, core legacy systems for 20 plus years, and then you bring someone young, energetic, you know, new methodologies, what we're finding is when you co-locate them together, they drive tremendous innovation together. Because what the one has is the experience, in terms of the systems, the business rules, how it all works, and then the other brings the innovation and the knowledge, the, the cloud, and what you find is one and one equals three in that world. And so what we actually find is that the, the workforce gets energized to work together. And it's a little bit of a renaissance for some folks in their careers, and it's a skills transfer for others. And so we have found this to be driving total productivity of projects coming up, and new levels of innovation that are being developed because it's new methods and techniques of working together, but it's about bringing diversity of skills together and getting different outcomes. So when I think about it, look, for all organizations that have existed for some period of time, what is the real challenge of transformation, right? The challenge of transformation is how do you bring the things 
that made you great, which were foundational for your organizations, your values, what you delivered, and how do you bring them forward in a modern way? And I think that's what everyone's trying to do, adapt the same types of services. And I think the same goes with skills. And I don't think it's an either or, right? So I can take a group of recent college grads and put them in office with pods and leave everyone else with metal desks and fluorescent light bulbs, right? But it's not an either or. It's how you blend the two together because you need the context. You do need the context, which is what some of the newer employees lack. You need the new methodology, which the new employees have, which the other doesn't have. To the extent you bring the two together, that's the success. I often get asked this about the workforce is, how do you blend you know, either the age or the skills? And I say, I actually need both. It's the combination that will make you great. And when you think of the organizations, fundamentally what they're, we're trying to do is not that much different from the core principles of the organizations, but you gotta blend the skill. And I think you can't lose the traditions of the past when you think about the future. But it's the blending of the two that really do make organizations great. I've been surprised, as Phil and I have talked about this quite extensively, I've been surprised how you know, young employees can be threatening to some of the more legacy employees until we started mentoring them and attaching them to one another, and then how they both got energized and were surprised. Each one was surprised by the other, what they either learned or what they got interested in, and the blend has made us better in some areas. And I think that balancing act, the challenge will be you'll need both. The real challenge, what's the balance? How long do you need which, and how do you balance those things that you think the future? So I appreciate the time. Hopefully this gave you some insight into some very real world examples that, you know, of individuals who've really made an impact to their companies, led them along a transformation. And these are things that are probably affecting your daily lives for many of you who live in some of these geographies. And you may not have known the story behind the story, but this is it. So as you walk through the show floor and you listen to some other speakers and they talk about projects, keep in mind these aren't just projects. Behind this is a business value, is a transformation of industries. And a lot of very simply, whether it's utilities, whether it's the government, Right? Whether it's uh, your, your wireless or data service is actually probably affecting your life right now as you're sitting here. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the CA.